Okay, we're going to do the uh, recordings for chapters 4 and 3. I do them in that order because uh, chapter 4 is about financial statements and then chapter 3 is about analysis, a lot of which is done best after you've completed the financial statement. So I think that it makes sense in that order. Also, if you think about um, the steps of the financial planning process, you want to gather data, and we put that data together, and I think that's putting that together, data together is, is about uh, gathering that data, you put it in the, together in, a, um, in, in financial statements so that we can get a clear picture of where we are. Then we analyze that picture, and I think that's the next step in the financial planning process. So that's, I, I just think that the textbook manufacturers got it, uh, got it a little bit backwards. Um, chapter um, three and four are fairly repetitive. Um, so a lot of the stuff that is at the end of chapter four is go is in more detail in chapter three. So you'll see that um, I'm going to post the entire PowerPoints. Uh, I may even glance, glance through the entire PowerPoint lecture, um, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time at the end of here in chapter four on stuff that we're going to get into more detail in chapter three. You'll see that in both of these chapters, um, that there's some stuff that I disagree with a little bit about the way it's presented. I'm still going to show it to you because I do want you to have an opinion other than mine, uh, but I, I, I would want you to pay attention to the way that I'm presenting things to you and think about it for yourself and see if that makes sense to you. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll make that clear um, when, when we get to it, but I'm not going to change uh, I'm not going to change the PowerPoint slides, and I want because I want you to be able to 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 see see it as as it's presented, and then take notes on on the things that I say about it. Okay, I am going to do break this uh, apart into recordings because chapter uh, three is fairly long. Uh, we are also going to bridge quite a bit of chapter three um, that we're not going to do we're not going to do the whole thing for that uh, either. So okay. Chapter four is about uh, is about the financial statements. Uh, I would I would suggest that there are really two basic uh, most important financial statements uh, in personal finance when we're dealing with individuals. And there's for those of you who've taken accounting classes or in or are accounting majors, you'll see that there's a lot of crossover. But I think the rules are a little bit um, more lax when it comes to dealing with individuals than it does to dealing with corporations. And I hope that that makes sense. At least I'll present it in a way. Firms that you work at may do things a little bit differently. I think the two most important statements are the balance sheet. If we say balance sheet, we can also say net worth statement um, or asset and liability summary. All of those things mean mean the same thing. Uh, and this is very similar to, um, to to a balance sheet that you would see for a corporation. And we'll talk about just a minor difference when we get into that. Um, I think that the statement of cash flows and the income and expense statement um, are in personal finance, those are basically the same thing. Um, I don't think we need to do two separate things. I think primarily we want to show all inflows and outflows uh, for our clients. And I think we can look, we don't need two separate statements. I think we can look and see that if we're taking a loan distribution, we know that that's not earned income, but we need to make sure that we have that loan distribution available in order to pay some bills that we have. Lots of you are borrowing money to go to school right now, and I think it's important that on one of the main financial statements that we reflect that. Um, this textbook manufacturer also talk, talks about a statement of changes in net worth. You can make a separate statement that explains the changes in net worth. Often you'll see an analysis where you'll see multiple years um, balance sheets or net worth statements side by side so that you can see the changes. And often you can explain changes or you can explain in more detail 
what shows up on one of the statements, either the balance sheet or the income, or, or, or we can we'll call it the income and expense statement of cash flows, the same thing, or the statement of cash flows. You can just make a footnote and actually explain uh, what's going on there. Um, that that'll get things done. We don't need to follow a rigorous set of generally accepted accounting principles like we would do if we were auditing a public corporation or something like that. This is for something that's usable and makes sense to our clients. So that's my take on it, but we will go into each one each one of these. Okay, so the balance sheet um, is organized um, assets, liabilities, and net worth. Um, the balance sheet, as we'll see, is as of a fixed moment in time. This is what stuff is worth. And often we'll see if we're do if I'm doing a financial plan fairly early in the year, I I might do a balance sheet. Um, it's not for auditing purposes of assets. What I thought they were worth, maybe as of the end of the year. Now, when we are meeting with a client, you know, let's say on March 15th, um, I will try to update their current, um, when I was in practice, I would try to update the current value of their investment accounts to make sure that that was reflected. But it's not as important to rec reflect a change if there has been any in, um, in let's say the value of their home for example. So we'll we'll talk more about that as as we get in as we get into detail as well. Uh, but it's as of it's as of a fixed moment in time. And we'll see in a minute that the um, that the income statement covers a specific period of time um, and and we'll talk about what the appropriate period of time or periods of time that you should show, whether it be monthly or yearly. I think most people think about different cash flows in different terms. So we'll talk about what's useful uh, to, for the purposes of doing financial planning. And we need to frame things in a way that are most useful for our clients. So uh, balance sheet. In the category of assets, and I'm, I'm going to pull up an example here in a minute, we'll probably start with the most liquid, and we'll have sort of three subcategories, cash and cash equivalents, investment assets, and then personal use assets. And even within those investment assets, I might have, uh, I might have after-tax, taxable, brokerage account investment assets, and then I might have retirement assets that are in a an IRA or in a qualified plan at someone, at some, through someone's work. And I'll probably list those in even further categories from that. So it's more easy, easy to access, um, or at least without tax penalty, um, our after-tax investment accounts versus um, our qualified plans and IRAs. So I'll list the um, I'll list our, our brokerage accounts first, and we'll get into an example more about that. Same thing with personal use assets. Lots of times we might not even list things that are that are use assets that we don't ever have a strong potential of gaining economic value from. Doesn't mean that they aren't worth anything. It doesn't mean um, that that. Technically, if we were trying to get someone's net worth exactly right, that we wouldn't want to list the value of their clothing and, 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 and their furnishings in their home. But if, if those are things that are n never going to be a major source of getting economic benefit out of those, if they're just use assets, then I probably won't want to list them. Um, so, or, or, or I may consider not listing them. Um, but I do want to list things that have certain have significant values, uh, personal real estate that tends to um, increase in value over time. Certainly, any collectibles that have a significant monetary value and don't tend to depreciate over time, I'll probably want to list those. I want to list list vehicles and things like that. Okay. Um, then over on the other side of the balance sheet. Um, we see we want to have liabilities that are listed in order of maturity. So when are they going to be due first? Now, lots of times current liabilities, I may uh, technically some 
um, textbooks might say that you're supposed to list your the mortgage payments that are due over the next 12 months under current liabilities and the mortgage payments that are due, let's say I've got 28 years remaining on a 30-year mortgage for the 27 years after that under long-term liabilities. I think it doesn't make sense to break those down. I don't think it makes anything more useful to our clients. We understand from the statement of cash flows that there are debt service requirements so um, that, that, that are part of that. And so I don't think that really necessarily helps things, and it might just be confusing for your clients. So I would consider a mortgage a long-term liability, and current liabilities would be things that are um, that would be that are going to either be paid off within the next 12 months or things that like credit card debt that I'm going to take a few months to pay off or something like that revolving short-term debt those are things that would be under current liabilities so here's an example of a balance sheet um, and we'll see what it balances from left to right. On the left side, I have assets, and on the right side, I have liabilities and net worth. And if I add up my liabilities and my net worth, that equals uh, my total assets. So, it, so the left side balances with the right side. That's sort of the check. Now, um, th that's the check to make sure that you did that you did it right. From a usable from a uh, use standpoint, the way we get to net worth is that we take our assets and then we subtract our liabilities. Whatever is left over is our net worth. And we'll see how that looks in a minute. So going back to what I said about how the balance sheet is organized, assets on the left, liabilities and net worth on the right, assets from my most liquid to my least liquid, and I'll have personal use assets down here um, and things like that. Sum those up. I'll have subcategories that will have so that will be summed up, and then I'll sum up my total assets on the left side. Uh, credit cards. If I'm paying off my cars, this is just me personally, if I'm paying off my cars within the next year, I'll have them under current liabilities. If not, uh, I'll have them under, under long-term liabilities. Student loans, depends upon when they're going to be paid off. Normally, they'll be under long-term liabilities as long as I'm not getting rid of them in the, in, in the short-term period. Of time. Credit cards I'll always have under current liabilities because that's something that should be paid off in the short run. So again, I sum up my current liabilities and my long-term liabilities, um, and then I sum both of those up to get to my total liabilities, and then I say, okay, here's my uh, my total assets, 1.5 million, minus my total liabilities, 507,000. That's how I actually get that net worth. So that means necessarily that if I add this and this up, this is just my check thing, uh, my check slot, total liabilities plus net worth, it means that I did subtraction the right way. Okay, so here's an important formula. Assets by minus liabilities equals net worth. That's something that um, that I want you to understand. Also algebraically, um, also algebraically, that means if we were to add liabilities to both sides, we would have assets equals liabilities. plus net worth. That's, sim that's just simple algebra. And that's, this is the balance, this is how the balance sheet balances around this equal sign. These are the two formulas that you probably, that are basically saying the same thing. I want you to know and understand them both ways. And if I were to put them in a different format, I'd want you to be able to understand that as well. So I might, uh, I, I might say, hey, then assets minus net worth must also equal liabilities. I want you to be able to understand the interaction between those terms.
Here's an example, a template um, for statement of net worth. Um, and it's just it's a good idea to get in habit. And I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a template that looks like this, and we'll probably do an example in class um, of 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 how you might present a statement of net worth, and you'll do that you do this in Excel. Um, and this this might be uh, what it would look like. I might break down um, taxes that are due into a separate category uh, and things like that. So you had to enter the date. This is a snapshot that's current as of a particular date. That's that's generally a, a an accounting rule. So I put a date and a year down there. Okay. Okay, um, a client stock portfolio increases in value by um, by three thousand dollars. So, what happens to each one of these things? Well, my asset increases by three thousand uh, dollars. My assets increase by three thousand. My liabilities remain unchanged. Therefore, my net worth also increases by three thousand dollars. So these are some examples you're going to have receive text uh, questions like this. A, a client buys dinner on his credit card. So here's what happens. Immediately, the client has uh, $500 worth of food. Then the food gets consumed. So immediately, I have liabilities. My, net, my credit card went up by $500, and my assets went up by $500. But then I consume the food, and so my assets go down. So net-net, really all that's happened is I have an increase in my liabilities. Therefore, I have a decrease in my net worth uh, by, by $500. Had I bought something that maintained its value, let's say I bought a table for $500, had I bought a table, then I would have an asset increase by 500 uh, and let's say it was on my credit card, a liability increase by 500 and net worth would then remain unchanged. I would just go from a liquid asset to a non-liquid uh, asset. And then oh, when I paid off my credit card, my liabilities would go down, my liquid assets would go down, and, uh, and and my liquid assets would go down as well. Okay, um, a client purchases a new car for forty thousand dollars with a a down payment of five thousand dollars in cash. So um, we will cars do depreciate over time, but we'll assume that it's still on the lot and it's still worth forty thousand dollars. So the client has Cash goes down by $5,000. Cars, another type of asset, goes up by by $5,000. So I've got a I've got a net uh, increase in my assets of $35,000. I also have a decrease in my liabilities. I mean, an increase in my liabilities of $35,000. Those offset each other, and then I have no change in net worth. So we need to understand what the limitations of a balance sheet are and how we, well we can do to present information that gives a more full picture. So we, it might not explain um, how an asset increased. Now, in we hope we hope that we have clients, particularly on investment assets, that have assets that appreciate over time. So we want to we want to be able to, and it's important to break down what portion of an increase in an asset was from a, a, a appreciation or growth rate. Uh, and when we get to chapter three, we'll we'll see how we might calculate that growth rate and what portion might be because I had. I had savings in the last year. And certainly for clients who are not working, the vast majority of them, we want, we're going to want to have saving on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> so how an asset or liability was uh, 
was acquired. So if I purchase an asset, that has to one you know basically liquid cash turns into another type of asset. Or if I inherited or received it as a gift, then I just have a gen uh, only an increase in the type of asset that I received. Uh, which those are going to have different impacts on my net worth. Um, okay, going to our ne our next um, sheet, which is our statement of income and expenses. Now, we're going to follow on our statement of cash flows or statement of income and expenses in in my world. Um, we're going to follow most of the rules of the income and expense statement. It's just we're going to show some cash flows that might not necessarily be pure income, might not necessarily be income, but are inflows. And, and um, we're going to show all of the cash flows that might not be necessarily pure expenses, but maybe but are outflows that might be going down to pay t to pay down debt. Um, so. One of the things that's important is to say, okay, this is for the year ending 1231-2015. Well, I think, how do people think about their income? I think people think about their income in, if you say, how much do you make? They might think about, what was my gross before tax salary last year? Other people might think of, this is how much my paycheck was, and I get paid twice a month. So they might think of their take home, which might be after taxes and some other things deducted out of their paycheck, on a monthly basis. Most expenses, I think clients think of on a monthly basis. And you gather information by framing it in a way that's how the clients spend it, but you report it in a way that, that, that's consistent. So I might show I should, might show clients this is your uh, an annual column and a monthly column right side by side in case that in case one way of thinking works more toward them. But for example, people might think of their vacation spending more on an annual basis. They might think of their dining out spending more on a weekly basis. Oh, I go out to eat twice a week and I on average I spend Seventy-five dollars when I go out when we go out to eat. So okay, that's one hundred and fifty dollars a week, about six hundred, you know, six or seven hundred dollars a month, somewhere in that uh, range. So um, so that's so that's how we might frame it. Other bills like mortgage payment that's paid monthly, or my utility bills are paid monthly. I have to pay my credit cards monthly, um, and. And, and so forth and so on. So I think the most common way to report particularly cash outflows is what happens on a monthly basis. So I think that's an important way to, I, I think it's certainly important to show a monthly column, but to explain things to clients about how we arrived at that monthly column, a monthly average, it doesn't make sense, $300 um, a month on vacation that doesn't really make sense. You spend, you might say, oh, you spend between three and four thousand dollars a year on vacation. That makes more sense to our clients, even if we're reporting it on on a monthly basis. So here's an example of what a statement of income uh, and expenses might look like, uh, particularly on an annual basis. Um, Again, we can have, I, I like the way that this is organized because we have inflows and then we have outflows first that are off the top. And including, so 401ks savings are going to come out of the paycheck before I even see it. And having savings that are not coming off the paycheck before they see it, but we want to enforce that good behavior like IRA and education plan savings where that comes off the top and then we figure out, okay, this is what we have left over. Then we need to figure out, okay, what are our fixed expenses, our, our fixed um, outflows? So we might have debt payments, we might have insurance payments in another category, and we'll go on and see uh, how that works. And then we get to 
our living expenses, so utilities, gas, lawn service, things like that. Um, I would probably put vacation. Um, I would probably put vacation and uh, entertainment and um, hobbies expense as almost a separate subcategory of, of of living expenses. So we can say, okay, you know, clump those things together that that people can think about. Okay, this is what you're. Um, what, what you're doing, the gifting. Um, I might put church donations if it's really important to the client. I might put that right up there with savings um, in that category. It just depends on how the client thinks about it. I would put the household utilities all together, um, you know, telephones, internet, cable, things like that. I would also put things that don't necessarily happen on a monthly basis that have to do with our house together, um, like um, like household maintenance. So on average, you know, this might be something that um, that only happens every few years where there's a where there's a major expenditure, um, and um, but we still need to we still need to plan for that, and we need to help our clients frame this is the cost of home ownership. Um, so we need to we need to include that as well. Um, insurance payments. You can put the uh, homeowner's insurance as part of the home expenses, or you can clump uh, you can clump it with the rest of the insurance premiums. Then we can have taxes. Lots of people will put taxes back closer to the top where it comes. It's right below uh, cash inflows, and you might even have things that come out of the paycheck like. I've got my gross inflows, and then I have my then I have my taxes that come out, and I have my savings that come out, and I have my um, whatever is contributed through my paycheck towards my health come out, and then I might have a net inflows, and then go from there, and then have other savings and and debt payments and insurance, and then go to um, go to what the variable expenses are. But you see this is a good way um, to organize a um, thing. Now at the bottom, hopefully we, we end up with a, with a number that's positive. Um, we don't want to end up with a lot, particularly on a planned basis, that's going unaccounted for. Often we ask our clients, what is, um, how much are you spending on this area? What's your income? And it ends up that they tell us that there's a very large surplus. And, they, and then we ask, okay, well, how much are you saving? Well, I'm saving, I'm saving five thousand dollars a year. Even after we take that into account, I've got somebody that takes home a hundred thousand dollars after taxes. They say they only spend forty thousand dollars, and so I'm and, and they save five thousand. And I'm going, okay, well, where's that other fifty-five thousand dollars? Well, I don't know. And so really they often people will underestimate. So if income minus expenses doesn't equal, you know, net, if I can't track a big net surplus, that probably really doesn't exist and then we're going to have to go back and say, okay, let's look at some more records and make sure that we get a, uh, maybe some better estimates of what's going on. Oh yeah, that's right, I'd probably spend a little bit more here and there. So we get to the reality of what our client's spending um, as important, I would say that um, this is one under coming up with a good statement of income and expenses or statement of cash flows is one of the most important steps uh, in data gathering um, because it, it it tells us um, how our clients are managing their current asset their current resources and we teach in this financial planning program, we teach a lot of technical things about how to do calculations and about different kinds of uh, retirement plans and tax rules and tax savings and tax advantage things um, and all these sorts of uh, legal documents that, that and strategies that our clients can use and different insurance products. But at the end of the day, um, for people who are saving for goals, people who are, aren't, haven't reached their goals yet, we generally need to have clients that are spending less than they're making. And so, um, and so 
that's really uh, people can generally control what they spend a little bit more than they control what they make, but they do certainly have an influence over uh, the controlling their income. I would submit to you that you are making a major investment in your income earning ability right now. So what you're doing now, being in school, is going to have a big impact on your future income. And it's not the last investment that you're going to make. There's continuing education, things that you do to improve yourself and the way that you um, that you coach yourself and try to improve your income earning ability as you move along your career path, those are things that to a certain extent you're, go you're going to have some impact on. So I want you to think about that as, you, as, you, as you're studying for, for these classes and you're deciding what to major in in college and so forth. So um, it's really important, though, to, that we get a good understanding for a couple of reasons. So we need to figure out how much we're going to save. But not only that, people tend to spend out of habit. Um, and and the, their goals are often a function of maintaining, at least maintaining, let's say, their lifestyle in the future when they stop working. So how much is it going to cost them to retire? Well, it's basically a function, largely a function of how much are they, does their lifestyle cost now? And so we, we need to understand how much retirement is going to cost. Well, that's a function of how long somebody's going to live, when they're going to retire, and how much they're spending each year. We don't know when they're going to die. We have some control over, they may have some control over when they're going to retire, and that might be affected by the advice that we give them. Uh, but in order to get even a reasonable estimate over how much retirement is going to cost, we really need to understand um, how much they're going to spend uh, on a given basis. And so here's where you're spending now, and here's how we anticipate that will change going forward critical, critical thing, and every recommendation that you make that costs money, whether it's buying insurance, increased savings, uh, increased savings for retirement, increased savings for education, uh, paying for an attorney to draft some documents, you have to account for for their cash flows. You can't just say, hey, I, I recommend that you save $50,000 a year. Well, I only make 75, so that's not going to work. Well, so you got to give a you got to give goals that are, are achievable uh, and realistic. Okay. Moving on from that. Okay. So limitations of the statement of income and expenses doesn't consider the purchase or sale of an asset. I would say that we can make a footnote about how that might happen, and on one of the two, um, that might the purchase or sale of an asset, we might make a notation. Uh, on, a, on the balance sheet about that, or if it's something that we're going to be using that cash from that, I might put uh, in, in the current year, um, I might put it on my um, statement of cash flows or, or the statement of income and expenses. Um, so, yeah, budget line items. Um, are monthly recurring expenses, um, and then a it might not include asset purchases. But look, I think that we're going to probably include um, savings, and those things are going to be specific asset purchases. We're going to we're going to include. And so, if it's savings for a goal to buy a boat, uh, as, if my client can't pay for that out of monthly cash flow. Um, then we need to help our clients plan for that, and, and that needs to be part of their ca monthly cash flow planning that they're going to save for that uh, particular purchase. So I don't necessarily agree that these things aren't reflected on a proper uh, financial statement for our clients. So here's a statement of changes in net worth. As I said, um, I think that this is, I think it can be a useful uh, separate statement, uh, or you can just make some notations um, about assets that appreciate or depreciate in value, gifts or inheritances, things that happen like that. And I think clients really know if they inherited or received something. We don't really have to point that out to them. And we're also, go we're definitely going to address um, our, our client's investment performance, uh, and we're going to make estimates of what investment performance would be going forward when we do our projections, and we're going to be very clear about what those things are. So, 
Um, so statement of cash flows, and in, in my you can read this if you want to in my book. This uh, on the personal side only. Uh, this is this is pretty much the same thing as an income and expense statement. Um, one of the key things is is as I talked about here um, is understanding budgeting, understanding wh what our clients are currently spending. Now, if we recommend that they save more, that may mean that I mean, and than they currently are. That probably necessarily means that we recommend that they are spending less. Now, um, financial planners, we want to be specific about how our clients can achieve their goals, but we don't want to micromanage how they spend. We want to guide them as they decide how they're going to spend less. And also, one of the things we come up so we can say, this is what you're currently doing and this is what we recommend. We might identify some areas of opportunity. But we don't want to say, oh, that's ridiculous. You don't need to spend that much money on electricity um, because um, because you're taking showers that are too long. We don't want to get to that level of micromanagement. We don't want to tell our clients that, hey, you're really having frivolous spending on clothes. That might be something that, that they can come on their own, and we can present information and say, these are areas of discretionary spending where you may have some control. And so you, then you enter that conversation and say, okay, what would that look like? And they may say, you know, I think we can cut here and here and here, but I don't really see where we really want to cut anymore. So I don't think we want to cut that much, and we will um, – so we're not going to save as much as you recommend, and that's okay. So maybe you recommend in order for them to reach their goals, they need to save an additional 10000 a year, and they say, well, we can only save an additional 6000 a year, and so that's okay. So we need to do some rebudgeting. So that means that you may retire a little bit later or reduce the, the value of some of, the, some of your other goals or – just take it, uh, or or take some increased risk in another way, and we'll get into a conversation more about that in class. Um, there's increased investment risk, which I think you can be got to be very careful about suggesting. But there's also the increased risk of you know maybe I'm less likely to reach my goals, uh, and so I need to be more flexible about I can still target the same retirement date and target the same level of spending, but I might need to be more flexible about pushing that back and or cutting back in the future. Because we don't know the future, that means we might a client might accept a lower probability of reaching their goals, and that might be something that's okay too. And we'll get into that um, uh, more in this class and as you go through the other classes in financial planning. So uh, the other thing that I want to point out about budgeting is that particularly when we're recommending that our clients spend less, I think we want to be um, sensitive to the fact that people have lifestyles and behavior is something that's hard to change. And so there might the clients might agree to spend a little bit less, but they might have a hard time doing it. I, th I mean, I think these are things that we all know. Knowing what you should do and then being able to enact it is good. So trying it and then saying, okay, Maybe I was too aggressive. Maybe we'll tweak some things. Or maybe what we'll do is, you know, maybe we can say, all right, we can cut back the, the spending here, but as you get raises, we're going to save more of your raises um, so that we're increasing our savings rate going forward. So it's a gradual thing. Maybe we're not saving our target amount tomorrow, but we're going to work towards saving our tar target amount over the next few years. And that's something that we have to monitor is helping our clients change their behavior um, and, and doing it in a way that they don't get, that they're not too ambitious and, and uh, don't get discouraged. We got to make sure that our recommendations are flexible so that they can fit our clients so that they'll continue uh, working on. That's a big part of uh, financial advising is, is, is the ongoing behavioral coaching that goes on around this. So uh, from a budgeting process, we do want to establish the goals with, our, with, with the client, the, the long-term goals, and then we'll have specific budgeting targets. 
um, and and it'll be based upon their income and an examination of their expenses. Um, and so, um, lots of times clients are c come in and they'll have a deficit spending situation where they're where they're you know making. And, and I would see this all across the income spectrum. I had clients that made half a million dollars a year but spent five hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So um, those people generally have a, a, a greater ability, whether it's willing or not, um, is another matter. Have a greater ability. People with higher incomes have a larger portion of their of, of their cash flows or of their budgets that are discretionary. Um, so, gen generally speaking, also the term discretionary um, is something that is is personally um, personally defined by you and the client. I think it's it's about how willing they are to cut back in certain areas. They might have priorities where, look, that private school education, I just have to pay that, and this is an area where I'm not willing to cut back. So we need to figure out what what discretionary means to them. And certainly uh, there's, um, in, in the long run, people would change if they'd ha if they had to, but they'd rather, they'd really rather not change certain things. So you, it's about you having a conversation with your clients and really being able to fill that out. And we'll see when we get to um, chapter three and we get into analysis and we get specifically into, um, we get specifically into emergency fund planning and doing ratios, making sure they have enough uh, money saved up. That that discretionary, uh, not discretionary versus non-discretionary spending is something that you need to feel out with your clients. Um, so one of the things of in terms of financial statement analysis. So you, you think uh, a, a picture of of we gather data. And then we perform some analysis on it, and, and putting together financial statements might be like taking an x-ray of our clients. But then we can do other, uh, other sorts of tests and analyze what we see there in a different way. And so we can perform analysis. But it's analysis, financial statement analysis, is a picture of where the clients currently are and what they're currently doing. And so understanding their current financial health and their current financial habits will help us understand what path our clients are on now to project going forward and how that path may need to change in order to get where they want to be and or they might need to change their expectations a little bit in terms of in terms of what uh, what goals are are realistically achievable there's a trade off between uh between um, changing that path and changing our perception of, of of what those goals are. And there's always there's always a set of trade-offs. So um, we can get into. I'll, I'll just briefly go over this stuff. I, I don't want to shortchange you. I think that's about all of chapter three that I wanted to go in in in, in depth with you. But I'll go fairly high level pretty quickly. Financial statement analysis. This talks. This is just different ways that you can um, that you can show the same present the same information. We can show rather than in dollars, we can show percentages of income and outflows. And often this is important, particularly if we're looking at um, different categories and say, look, this is how much you're really spending on housing and not just your principal interest taxes and insurance, but home maintenance, your utilities and all that sort of stuff. This is how much you're spending on your housing. This is how much you're spending, or we can say, this is how much you're spending as a percentage of your monthly outflows on your, on that. And, and so if we clump those together, we might be able to, do, uh, to, to show that. Horizontal analysis really lets us um, show information across time if we're looking at both income over time and or assets and balance sheets over time. So looking at either statement, we can often see percentage changes. Um, so that's, that's um, pretty helpful. 
And then so there's ratio analysis uh, that we that we talked about doing, and I'll get well. This is where we'll get a lot more into in in chapter three. Here you see that there are three primary categories of ratio analysis: liquidity, debt. Uh, and performance ratios, and we'll get into uh, we'll get into each one of these in, in, in a lot more detail. Savings rate a lot a lot of them are universally important, and a lot of them are are, are situationally important to do. I don't think we don't want to necessarily overburden our clients with conducting every kind of ratio. We always almost always want to know what's their emergency fund ratio, what's their savings rate. We want to almost always do those things, but we might want to present information in a way that is specific to our clients if, if, we, if we see that something is a particular problem. Also, we don't want to just focus on problems. We want to tell our clients when they're doing a good job of doing something. We want to acknowledge um, and reinforce good behavior as well, because trust me, we are going to tell our clients that they need to change some things. That's generally why uh, people come to us as financial uh, planners. So we don't want to have it just to be a session, though, of all bad news and here's what you need to change. Uh, return ratios. We saw, we saw this. Um, we saw this back when we were talking about inflation. This is basically just a, a all the return ratios: return on investments, return on assets, return on net worth, are just um, examples of the basic growth rate formula. And we'll we'll talk about the implications of what those mean a lot more uh, when we get into chapter three.